All right, this morning we'll be in Matthew, the uh, fifth chapter. You know, I've, I've been in a habit, and I've done it ever since I've been a pastor, because I've been pastor of what I call a small church, okay? And that's what, when somebody asks me where I pastor right now, I tell them in a small church in Frank City. But you know, Randy Davis brought a thought out the other day when, we was, when he was speaking to us. I'm wrong in what I'm saying. I'm wrong. Because he says, truly, there is no small church and there is no mega church. It's God's church. So from now on, I'll be referring to Mount Zion as God's church. Amen? Amen. He also mentioned something else. We try to measure success, I guess, in the in the, uh, the way of churches, you know, you've heard people say that you count numbers. And he made the phrase, and I'd never heard it before, we uh, measure churches by noses and nickels. Let that one sink in, okay? <laughs> how many noses are there and how many, what the offering is like, amen? Well, we're not going to discuss that this morning. So from now on, this is not a small church, this is God's church. Amen? Mount Zion. If you'll stand with me this morning as we read from God's Word, the fifth chapter of Matthew. Again, about the 13th verse, he says, you are, This is Jesus talking. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day, and thank you for the wonderful fellowship that we have at this church. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come out this morning. Remember those that are sick and remember those that have sick family members. Remember those, Lord, that have, uh, have succumbed to this coronavirus. Lift them up this very day and give them encouragement. Be with us in each and every day and everything that we do and say, for we give you the praise, honor, and glory for everything. In Christ's name I ask it all. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> also, another thing Brother Davis brought was that talking about the coronavirus, there's been 50 pastors that died from the coronavirus in the state of Tennessee. Actually, 500 different pastors have caught the COVID and had the COVID. So you need to be in, much in prayer for your pastor and be much in prayer for all of the churches that have had a problem, have lost pastors. In the way of introduction this morning, I was thinking back, I've watched reruns a lot of times, or we have uh, the Andy Griffith Show, and maybe you do too. I mean, uh, at least it's good, clean fun. Amen? And Andy Taylor, the sheriff of Mayberry, one, one day he was, had to go out of town on business, so he left Barney in charge of the sheriff's office, okay? So he was in charge, so he deputized Gomer Powell to be his deputy, amen? So the two of them were out in the evening time, and uh, they were walking down the street one evening, and uh, they happened to notice that somebody was robbing the bank at Mayberry. So, man, here they go, you know, Barney and, and Gomer, and they get over and they hide behind a car, and they're watching and they sat there and they think and they shake and they didn't know what, exactly what to do. And finally, uh, Gomer looks at Barney and says, uh, you know, we need to call the police. And they sat in there and then finally Barney turns around and looks at him and says, but we are the police. <laughs> you know something? Right now in church, we need to... <laughs> How would you say, we are the police? 
The ones that are here, we're it. We're the ones that are to be, the Bible says, the salt of the earth. That's what Jesus Christ, we are to be the salt. We're not to rely upon someone else. We're not to rely upon uh, books or, or television or anything. We are the salt. We are the ones that are to do the work. We could do the same about our church. We are the body of Christ. And when we look around at ourselves, we need to say, we need to do something. We don't need to just sit and do nothing. We need to do something. You're going to find that in Mark 12, 37, it says, And the common people heard Him gladly. And this was said of Jesus, and guess what? It was a great compliment of Him. It was said partly because He used illustrations which help us to understand. You know, in the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes that we've been talking about in the last few sermons, Jesus talked a lot about what we are to do, what we are supposed to be doing. We are to extend mercy. We are to receive comfort. We make peace. We receive lots of blessings because of those things. Today, it's not so much what we do, but who we are to a watching world. In the, and remember this, the world is watching you. If you profess to be a Christian this morning, the world is watching you. They have their eyes on you to see what you are going to do. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see a reflection of yourself. And I want you to, next time you look in the mirror at yourself, remember this, this is what other people see. They see the same thing. Speaking of mirrors, it reminds me of a story. There was a private school, and it was for uh, youngsters. Anyway, the girls there were at, they were 12 years old. And at 12 years old, they began to experiment with Makeup and lipstick and all of these things. So, like I said, it's a private school. And these girls would put on lipstick of the morning. And they would, they would really smear it on. And, but then, to blot it, they would go to the bathroom and they would put their lips on the mirror to blot out the lipstick, okay? And the little girls would do that every morning. And the custodian would have to come in in the evening and would have to clean those mirrors. And he finally got upset. And he told the principal of the school, we got to do something about this. So the next day, she called all the girls into the bathroom where they'd been doing this and told them, said, now girls, and brought the custodian or the maintenance person with them. And so the girls were having a problem. This lipstick keeps getting on the mirrors and it's problems for him to get it cleaned off every day. said, I want you to show them how difficult it really is to get this lipstick off of that. So the man takes, turns around, takes his squeezy, dips it in the toilet, comes up and scrapes off the <laughs> mirror with it. They never had another problem. Amen. <laughs> it's what is in that mirror that we need to remember. Remember that what you see is what we get. Amen? What you see in that mirror is what you and I get. It's what your neighbors get. It is what everyone at church gets. So how you react, how you look, how do you look before God today? Jesus used an analogy he talks about some you statements. When he says, first of all, you are the salt and the light. The salt and the light. An ancient Roman official once commented, there is nothing more useful than salt and sunshine. Amen? We got to have salt to season our food and we, sunshine makes us feel better. We came out this morning, 
honestly this morning at home in beautiful, bright sunshine. And we got to Spring City and there's nothing but clouds. Wow, I don't know. I hope it's still sunshiny at home. I know this, as it rained yesterday, I sat and watched my grass grow. <laughs> it actually, I believe you could see it growing. Amen? Teach me to put fertilizer out again. Amen? But following the Beatitudes, Jesus uses illustrations to help us see what we are and how we affect the world. How do we affect the world? If Christ is truly in us, in the eight ways that are called blessed in the Beatitudes, then what are you showing? What is showing right now? We are to be like salt. Salt penetrates and light radiates. We are to be separate and we are to be different from the world. Keep those two thoughts in your mind. We are to be separate and we are to be different than the world. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Romans 12.2 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some people got the idea Separation means to be isolated. That we, when we are separated from the world, we are completely isolated. That is not what it's telling us. We are not to be a, we are not to be a monk. <laughs> you know, I, the religions that have the monks that are, live in a monastery, more power to them. But that is not what Jesus commanded when He said to be ye separate. He says, come out and live separately. Live differently than the rest of the world. Jesus said, we are in the world, but not of it. So do not, this morning, be conformed to the world, but rather confront the world. You have to face it daily. You've got to be out there every day in the world itself. But we need to learn to be salt and we need to be learned light. So this morning, my question to each of you here this morning is, are you a salty saint? The Bible says we're saints. If you're saved, you're a saint. Did you know that? We talk about St. Peter, you're a saint. Amen? So what is salt? Salt is a mineral. And it's been used for thousands of years. Archaeologists have found in places like Romania where people were boiling water to extract salt. Salt works in China that date back many thousands of years. So salt has been around for a long, long time. At one time, salt was even used as currency. You could buy things with salt. That's how valuable it was. It's been around a long time. But I say all of this to when Jesus is using salt as an example, guess what? It's not surprising to anyone, is it? Because everyone would have known what He was talking about. They would have known. Everyone knew about salt. Since everyone was listening, they would have used it. They would have seen it. They would have tasted it. They'd probably even had to buy it. So they would have known all about salt. Did you know that salt is a miracle? It is. Salt is a miracle. You think about it. You take, it's composed of two poisons. Chlorine and sodium. Both of them are poisonous. If you took either one of them in, separated, you would die. Okay? In fact, chlorine is so deadly that you could actually kill yourself in your own home with chlorine. You mix ammonia and bleach together, you better be out of the house, okay? Because it gives off chlorine gas, which is very deadly. Put them together, and what do you have? You have ordinary salt. It's used 
to bring death. Some These two things that could bring death come together to bring what? Hmm? Something that we all use every day, right? Very common thing. Hmm. Think about this. It's just like your Christian life. Sin and death. That's what you had when you were born without Jesus Christ. That's what you have to look forward to. Sin and death. Two poisonous things. Amen? But you put them together and you come together under these two negatives and bring Jesus Christ into it. And guess what? You have redemption. You have something wonderful in the end. I was listening to this song and I was listening to Jimmy Swagger's version, but Doris said there's a better one. I don't know. But anyway, it took a miracle. The words go, it took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when He saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Put those two things together. And it is a miracle, isn't it? So what does Jesus mean by calling us salt? Hmm? This is an illustration. Why does He call us salt? Why does He say that we ought to be salt? Let me give you a few examples. First of all, salt irritates. How many has ever got salt in a wound? <laughs> Don't feel good, does it? It hurts. It burns, doesn't it? I had a little... I don't know where I got it at, but I got just a little cut place on the end of my finger. Boy, you touch salt to that, and you know what? It burns. Also, that hand sanitizer does too. Amen? That we all use gallons of. Amen? And Christianity, I can tell you this, rubs a lot of people the wrong way, doesn't it? It irritates a lot of people. Did you know that? It does. Christianity does. We shouldn't be try to be irritating, but don't be surprised when it happens. Don't, don't be surprised when some people, that they actually get offended by Jesus Christ. I, don't, I just can't see how that could happen. But why? So salt irritates. Salt also seasons. How many of you use a salt shaker at the table? Huh? Yeah. I've seen people that they put so much salt out there, they, they put more salt than they do food. Amen? I don't know. I don't do that. I use very little. I do sometimes use a little, but not much. I do not like my food real salty. Actually, it's what you get used to when your life is what it is. But Christians ought to what? They ought to add zest, tang, and a sweet, good flavor to everything. We should be that, 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 that zing. We talk about zing, putting a zing in your step. Christians ought to be that zing. They really should. Your workplace should be a better place because you're working there. You, as a Christian, in your house, maybe not everyone's a Christian, but you need to live your life as a Christian and let them know that that is the way to live. <laughs> I've seen people that think a Christian they're supposed to be bland and neutral and don't do anything. Don't get excited about nothing. Amen. We just don't get excited. I go to church and I just sit there and be real, real quiet and then I get up and leave. Amen. That is not what a Christian is supposed to do. There's nothing wrong with saying hallelujah once in a while. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let it be known. Young people, kids, going to school, you need, those schools need some salt. They need to know what it's like being a Christian. I heard a, we went to a rally one time in, in Pigeon Forge, and I remember the sermon to this day. And he said, he was telling the kids, dare to be different. Dare to be different. 
Live a life. Don't just get out from the crowd and live a Christian life. Dare to be different. Everywhere Jesus went on this earth, a good spirit would follow him, wouldn't it? The attendance, people would flock around. Why? Because as as it said in here many times, we've never heard anybody speak like this. So when when you're speaking, do do people understand you're a Christian? And they want to hear what you're saying. A lot of Christians think that you've got to be a bland, blend in type person. No, you don't. We should be like salt. Salt also creates thirst. <laughs> okay? Your job as a Christian is to make others thirsty for God. In John 4. Jesus answered and said unto her, I, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is it that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given, you, given thee living water. Jesus Christ says what? Drink from him and you will have living water. We need to make people thirsty for that living water that Jesus, only Jesus Christ can give. It only comes from Jesus. You can't create thirst, though, unless you're a salty Christian. Amen. Walking to the beat of a different drum. The Bible says we need to be out there. Out there in more ways than one. We need to be out there for Jesus Christ. We need to be out there on the highways. We need to be out there spreading the gospel. We need to be out there every day doing our job. We need to be a salty saint. The only way you can be a salty sink right here is the salt shaker this morning. This, this church is the salt shaker. But it does no good until we what? Until we get it out of the shaker. You need to go out those doors for Jesus Christ. When you walk out that door, you walk out and say, hey, I'm living this life for Jesus. Jesus. He's going to be mine. He's going to be my friend. And I'm going to tell the world about him. You need to be like a zebra in a herd of horses. He's going to kind of stand out, isn't he? As a Christian, you need to stand out in the crowd. Salt also cleanses and it heals. Salt, if you put it in a water softener, it'll clean away lime scale. And a salty gospel will do what? It'll convict and cleanse people. And what does it cleanse them of? Sin in their life. It'll clean them of that sin. These things are, are true in application, but I believe the primary interpretation of this is just a little different. Jesus is who? He's speaking to the disciples. Many of whom were what? They were fishermen, right? When they catch their fish and they take it from one town to the next, how did they keep it from smelling like fish? Fish smells, doesn't it? What did they do? They packed it in salt, didn't they? It kept it from spoiling. They would salt it down. So salt does what? It preserves. It keeps you safe. Hmm. How about our society today? I believe that it needs the salt of the Spirit of Jesus Christ because we are living in a rotting, dying world. Look at it around you. It's dying slowly. It's getting faster all the time, by the way. When I grew up and I was a teenager and kid, and we and we got that thing called TV, and, and on Saturdays they had a, a, a music show that it was called Dick Clark's Show. Anybody remember that? American Bandstand? You remember it? You know what my parents said about that? Why that stuff? You shouldn't be listening to that. That's terrible. You need to get that, get that out of your mind. Get in something else. Man, if they could see MTV now. Oh, Lord. They'd have thought Dick Clark was a Sunday school teacher. Amen? 
Wow. Think about it, how it is rotting and decaying right before our eyes. <laughs> look, look, look at the movies. Does anybody remember Gone with the Wind? And all the big controversy at the end when Clark Gable gave out his one word. One word. The whole country was up in arms that he had, was allowed to do that on the movie screen. Look at the movies today. You can't find one now that there's not so much profanity that you can stand to watch it. <clears throat> Dora, and well, we hadn't been watching in a while. She's been on Golden Girls. But we used to watch I Love Lucy all the time. Okay? Love, I Love Lucy. Amen? Remember this? If you ever watch them in the bedroom, what the hell? How many beds to hell? They had two beds, right? Can you imagine the time that when you turned it on and wow, they're in the same bed. Whew. Never, I love Lucy, by the way. They never were in the same bed together, okay? Think about what it goes on in these movies and this television show. It's in television shows. And in fact, we're talking about profanity. They even have profanity in the cartoons now. Have you ever watched some of those cartoons that kids watch now? They don't watch Bugs Bunny. I do that. <laughs> I watch Popeye and Bugs Bunny and, and, and Tom and Jerry. They don't watch them. They, their cartoons are not what I call decent cartoons. Amen. Humanism and evolution tell us that the world's getting better. Everything is getting better. But we know that's false. We know that it is going downhill. And it is going downhill faster. The Bible promises that in Revelation. So you say, then why? If the Bible says it's going to happen, why do I even have to try? Why do I even try? Why don't I just give up? You know why? It is still your duty. It came from God's Word. It's your duty to spread the Gospel to everyone that you possibly can. It's like the flood of, uh, on the ocean when they washed up a whole bunch of, I think it was starfish. And anyway, there's a kid walking along the bank and he'd take it up and he'd pick one up and he'd throw it out back out in the ocean. Guy come along, there was just millions of them up here. And they said, you know, why are you, why are you doing that? He said, nobody cares. He said, Whoop, that one did. Amen. That's the same way we should be about lost people. We need to, we need to be out there trying. And it'll make a difference to them. If they get saved, it'll be different to them. What the world, what will the world be like if there was no salty Christians? I'll give you a clue. Read Revelation. You'll find out what it's like when all of the, of the, the, the saints of God are gone. If you think it's a downward spiral now, just wait. Right now, we need some salty saints to do what's right. To take a stand at work, wherever you're at. We need salty saints who will come together against abortion, against pornography, against homosexuality, against gay marriages. The Bible says, ye are. Ye are what? Ye are not ought to be, not could be, not should be, not it would be nice if to be, but it says, ye are the light and the salt of the world. People take that to heart. So when you go out, when you're down at the Walmart, live like a Christian. But don't be, oh, I'm I don't want to do anything. Man, be happy. You got the greatest of all gifts. You got eternal life in heaven with Jesus Christ and God Himself. So let's look back at that 13th verse. And, but if the salt has lost his savor. <laughs> so what are we talking about if it's lost its savor? It doesn't say that you can lose your salvation. Okay? You can't do that. 
But you do lose some things. You lose your influence. You lose your testimony. Hmm. You know when that happens? When you lose your Savior is when you stop trying. When you give up. When you say, I, I'm just spitting against the wind. So I'm just going to give up. I'm just not going to do it anymore. That is when you lose your Savior. The Bible says, you are to be the hammer, not the anvil. Amen? You're to be giving blows, not taking them. Amen? You're either warming the world, or the world is making you cold. And you know what God said about lukewarm Christians? He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'd rather you be cold, or I'd rather you be hot. Trodden under the foot of men. <clears throat> Look around at what is happening right now in the world. Christians are being trodden down everywhere. We're being made fun of. We're being called names. Do you remember in the Bible? You remember Lot? What happened to him? He was saved. But he wasn't living it, was he? He was supposed to be salt, but he had lost his savor. And instead of influencing people, he couldn't even change his own family. He tried to reveal the truth to his own family, and it would not work. What did they do? They laughed at him. God spared that city for a long, long time. But eventually... The sky fell. Though Lot was delivered, what happened to his wife? She just couldn't stand what she was giving up, so she turned to look back and turned to a pillar of salt. Now that salt is there forever. What does it remind us of? <laughs> it reminds us of the fact that we are salt. Okay? We can turn back but we need to hold on to the Savior as long as we can. And like I said, as it shows in this picture, we need to get out of the shaker. You need to go out these doors for the Lord. It's great to see you here on Sunday morning, but you need to live for Him seven days, 24 hours a day. Never change that. Everybody stand if you